We do have Jada trapped in this room. It is locked. He cannot escape. <laughs> used to have lunch at some time. That's it. Yeah, that's true. Good. We can do that. What if we were eating while we did it? We were like, <laughs> so God. It just becomes a <laughs> ASMR. <laughs> yeah, it'll be terrible. It's like, people get really close to a mic and they're like, hello. They like whisper. And some people will listen to ones that they eat food. Yeah, like just, <laughs> uh, just hear everything. Yeah. It's just like, ah, gosh. I ain't trying to have people that close in my ear all the time. Welcome to TikTok Theology, a podcast that tackles the major trending topics on social media that concern the Christian faith. I'm Megan. And I'm Steven. We know you can't form a theology in three minutes or less, but those videos can identify current issues. TikTok will give us the prompt and then we'll do a deep dive. Thanks for joining us in this exploration. Hi, friends, and welcome back. This week, we have um, another just lighthearted conversation surrounding some of the easiest topics in theology. That is a lie. Mm. So don't worry. Today, we're talking about the uh, reconciling the violence of God mm. in the Old Testament, um, primarily. But mm-hmm. I feel like this one is a, and it seems kind of niche in the way that we're talking about it as a yeah. theological discussion. But um, I've seen a lot in conversations around um, Christianity and stuff on social media, especially as we've been in a kind of an interesting climate in the world where we have like the Israel-Palestine conflict. We have yeah. the Ukraine-Russian right. conflict. Yeah. And we have obviously a lot of Christians, with a lot of opinions on these two things. That's not what we're discussing today. But it has brought up a lot of conversations on social media about this concept of is God like violent like right. what's his view like is this view on war and like the old testament god seems to have a very different view on you know wars and and violence than maybe the new testament portrayal of god does right. and um you know all of those different conversations that we're having and and really hashing through um at this space in social media and christendom as a whole uh and so we're gonna tackle that topic today yeah but we're not just alone nope we have a very special guest today yes we do I, I think it is one of the hardest, if not, it might be the hardest topic of biblical studies, like the hardest kind of like single topic. I mean, there's been so many theologies that just kind of have gone awry trying to even solve this problem. Like yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we got the demiurge and two different gods and stuff like that, like in the past. And like, uh, just like, oh, the Old Testament God must be different than the New Testament because right. Jesus' witness is so different. And so um, and it's a question that in- inevitably students always ask. Yes. And even in church and people will like just church members will ask, um, you know, different people, any Bible study, anything that always comes up. And a lot of times the answers are not good. And it's even <laughs> the case where like the answers for this aren't entirely satisfactory even still, even yeah. when you you've studied and learned a lot. So we thought no better guy to ask <laughs> than one of our favorite guys on the whole planet. Dr. Jim W. Adams. Woo! All right. Thank you. Right now, everybody <laughs> in their car is cheering. Everyone in oh, like, the Hebrews are cheering. They're all yeah. cheering. The Old Testament Theo class is cheering. Boo. Boo. Hebrews is what we call the dudes that are in um, in the Bible, uh, <laughs> biblical studies major. All the dudes are the Hebrews. J-Dub has a, a fan club of Hebrews. He does. He has, he has, he has a the fan J-Dub club. fan club. Yeah, but like I'm part of the J-Dub fan Me fan too. Club, you know what I mean? He, he has a much broader fan club than that. Oh, uh, you guys are too nice. Me and Megan were like, you know what? People need to hear J-Dub. And so instantly, factual. instantly, I was like, we need to have him as a guest. And I wanted you to be a guest last season. And then you were like, no, I need at least four years to actually think about this topic <laughs> in order to, <laughs> before we talk about it. So we gave you until season two. And now he's here starting out our first guest of season two, which we're super excited about. It. So we've been kind of dancing around it. He is a longtime professor at Life Pacific University. Mm -hmm. He's an Old Testament scholar, did his PhD at Fuller. Um, He's written a lot about all sorts of stuff of Old Testament studies, but particularly has been focusing on speech act theory and commands in the Mm -hmm. Old Testament. And um, he's just a, he's just a very wise, awesome dude. He's been here. It's over 20 years, right? 25 or something? Uh, This is 27, heading in 28. Man. Yeah. Crazy. He's worked here longer than Megan's been alive. (laughs) It's true. Um, And so... uh, Jade, didn't you teach my mom? Yes. Oh, man. 
generation to crazy lords. Yeah. Um, but she was my yeah, first then, my first class. So 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 it's not that crazy. No. Okay. And then you talk Kelsey. So yeah, you've got so he's been harassed by a generation of me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just every single one of my family. And just and, and <laughs> harassed. Uh, I wouldn't put Aww, it that way. No, they're, they're, the, the lords are good students. They're, yes. uh, they're good uh, to have as students. Joy. So, for sure. Joy to have. Um, also, one little tiny fact is he's also an avid skater. That's true. Mm-hmm. And surfer. Mm-hmm. And um, I have wanted to do this for a long time, but... One of the things that we do in our programs, we do music videos, and I just had J-Dub as a special cameo guest skateboarding and um, in our music video. So we're going to link that in the show notes so that way you can see J-Dub in his element. <laughs> so in the bridge of the song Weep No More, check it out. You're going to see J-Dub. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was so good. See, when he does things with us, it's fun. It's yeah. a good time. Yeah, we just got to get him to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here we go. Jim, the first question that I hear all the time from students is why does the character of God seem so different in the Old Testament than in the New Testament? And like I was just alluding to, I mean, this is where we even like, some people have tried to solve that problem by creating a demiurge and saying that God is different in there, you know, there are different gods there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, this is kind of the big question. How should we as a church understand these differences and uh, how should they shape our theology? Yeah, so I think that um, first and foremost, Jesus himself in the gospels obviously and the gospel writers as well as the new testament writers identify jesus as the god of israel Mm -hmm. so the god of israel is one deity but by the time we get to the new testament he obviously is then revealed as three we get hints at it in the old testament yeah so jesus is this same god so what marcion did in the second century in creating really the first canon Mm. in seeing this radical difference between Jesus's teachings and the God of the Old Testament, that this debate, this question has been since Jesus's teachings almost, Mm -hmm. that uh, these are two different gods. But I think we certainly see Jesus commanding us in Matthew, in Luke, love your enemies. Hmm. And we seem to see God in the Old Testament uh, violently attacking enemies. Mm-hmm. But if we look carefully at Jesus' words too, he, he says himself also that I don't come to bring peace but a sword. He is, talks about eternal damnation. He is um, one who makes a whip in John and casts out the uh, sellers in the uh, temple. So there, there's a lot of cooperation between what we see in the Old Testament and what we see in the New Testament with Yahweh and Jesus being a part of that deity, if you will, the mm-hmm. second person of the Godhead. So I think we'll, if we look carefully, there's a lot more cooperation between what, how Jesus is depicted and how Yahweh is depicted in the Old Testament. That being said... We don't see Jesus developing the church or instructing the church to be an army that's going to go out and conquer, physically conquer other lands. Mm -hmm. That that's a difference that we see where Israel is actually a nation with boundary markers, with a land that uh, Yahweh has given Israel, where the people of God are located on that land. Whereas now within Christianity, obviously Christians are global. Yeah. So let's say, you know, if if we were to like build an army uh, of a country and go attack another country, you're attacking Christians. Yeah. Right. And that's They're the problem everywhere. with war is I think some wars are legitimate if you're protecting yourself. But if we're in any in any case, if the U.S., for example, goes and attacks another nation, we are inevitably going to kill Christians. Yeah. That's the problem with war in general. But I think we're seeing a lot more cooperation between what we see with Jesus and Yahweh than there are differences. Yeah. I, just a little sidebar about um, you know wars and just, I think, you problematizing that idea, I think is really important. Because one of the issues of Israel becoming a state again 
is that they specifically became a secular state, Mm -hmm. that they became a state that's intentionally not the same nation state that was in the Mm -hmm. Old Testament, Mm -hmm. um, you know, when they, in the 1900s, when they, when they became a state again. And I think that is part of the, uh, when, when Christians are saying like, we need to be pro-Israel and stuff like that, which I'm not saying that we shouldn't, you know what I mean? Like, I think Israel is certainly justified to respond to, you know, what Hamas did. Like, there's no question about that. Mm -hmm. But I think sometimes people see that as like, they're part of a holy war and you need to, you need to be backing Israel because God's on Israel's side when even, even that, like it's supposed to be a secular state. So it's like, it's, they have themselves made a distinction between that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and I think it's important in the old Testament that Israel is not because Israel is God's people. They're not exempt from God's punishment. Yeah. It's judgment. Uh, And so, to be blindly pro-Israel and, oh, God's for them no matter how they act right, is, well, ridiculous, but also doesn't correspond with the Old Testament. Right. No, that's a good point. Yeah. I yeah. mean, you could even say that God puts Israel up on extra scrutiny, you know, because they are his people. Absolutely. And so they're, they're under more pressure, if you will, yeah. of being God's people. And so they're, so the nations typically, when God is when he has the prophets speak against the nations and, and there's the threat of uh, violence, let's say, with the other nations, there it's more generalized. Oftentimes it's based on their pride, whereas mm-hmm. Judah and Israel, they're in trouble because they're not following the law. They knew better right. where the nations aren't in that category. They, even you don't see nations being condemned for their idolatry. Mm-hmm. Very much. No. Israel's condemned for their idolatry. Because yeah, they're in covenant with God. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. That's good. Also, I think when you were answering the question, another um, idea I had or, or thought I had uh, coming up is, do you think we understand the rhetoric of God's violence mm-hmm. better by understanding Jesus and how he used violence rhetorically. For instance, like when he's going with the whip, this is a prophetic demonstration that salvation is going to come through Christ and that the uh, system of um, atonement that the Israelites used forever was uh, outdated, outmoded, and now it is coming through Christ. And so it was um, a symbolic gesture. Mm. And so he used that in rhetoric as opposed to like a goal to hurt people or, Mm. you know, and even when you said, you know, I didn't come to make peace, I came to make war to set Mm -hmm. daughters against mothers, uh, sons against fathers and stuff like that. He's using a rhetorical device there too, Mm -hmm. I think to talk about ultimate allegiance to God Mm -hmm. over even familial things, even that, you know, when he's talking about, if you're going to follow me, hate your mother and your father. And I think that's kind of like, it's breaking this glass ceiling of a metaphor. Like our love for God needs to be far beyond even, you know, our, our greatest loving relationships on earth and True. Um, in the total devotion. I think does, does that, cause we can, I think easily understand the way or not easily. I think it's still difficult for people, but like, um, it's still like not, <laughs> not necessarily easier than in the old Testament. We can understand the way Jesus is using his words rhetorically. Yes. Does that help us to understand how the old Testament, how God is using, you know, calls for violence rhetorically there? I think there's some truth there, but I think we can also see that, rhetorical device occurring in the Old Testament itself. Mm -hmm. So in other words, one of the more troubling words in the Hebrew Bible in relationship to war is the word harem, Mm. which is oftentimes translated as utterly destroy. Mm. And it's coupled with oftentimes with war and it involves people groups. So like when the conquest, when Joshua yeah. and Israel's going into the land there to utterly destroy Jericho, utterly destroy other people groups. And it's it seems pretty, you know, gnarly. I mean Yeah, for sure. And everybody's obliterated. <laughs> but if we look at how the ancient Near East, so there's a guy named uh Younger who did this uh study on ancient conquest accounts uh-huh. and he was looking at ancient or eastern stuff and how they're using hyperbolic language. Yeah, totally. And Mm -hmm. that then is what we're seeing as well in the Old Testament. So when that word is used, so there's two problems with the word. One is it probably is better to understand that word as ban or even remove, not utterly destroy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's more about removing Israel from religious paraphernalia as well as the influence of the Canaanites. Yeah. Rather than going and slaughter. Hmm. Yeah. Um, now, 
it can involve destroying, but destroying religious paraphernalia where right. it cannot be used. This is the problem of Achan in the early parts of Joshua. He steals that that paraphernalia, and now violence is outbroken on him mm. due to that sin. And what's fascinating is that in Joshua, that's the only instance where you have God being angry and violent in Joshua mm. is with his own people. Wow. So what we're seeing back to your question is, is that this hyperbolic language Israel would have understood. Yeah. So you have, for instance, in what this is called the Merimpatah Stella, which is the Egyptian pharaoh talking about how he wiped out Israel, but they weren't wiped out. Right. Same with the Mesha inscription. King Moab says he actually harmed Israel, destroyed Israel, but they weren't destroyed. It's just a way of talking yeah. hmm. about conquering, not completely slaughtering everybody. So I think Jesus is actually in that similar mode, if you will, uh-huh. for sure. Then what, what we see. So, like another example is when a person commits adultery, you're to stone them to death, mm-hmm. but nobody's ever stoned to death in the Old Testament. Hmm. So that's either well they didn't obey anyway, so they're not going to obey that. But yeah. if you look at like with John eight, when Jesus is confronted with the adulterous woman. And Mm -hmm. he says, the person without sin cast the first stone. We always think in terms of, well, they were all convicted of sin, which is quite possible and probably a reality. Mm -hmm. But maybe also, because they're testing Jesus, Mm -hmm. oh, we got it right. We don't do this typically. And it would have been hypocritical for us to actually stone her. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we see this kind of gnarly language, Mm -hmm. but it's not acted out. So Rahab is not, she's... Under this harem, but she's she survives. Hmm. She's not put to death. So yeah, I think we need to. And this is the this is the thing about the Bible is we need to. We, if you just kind of cursory read Joshua, we either spiritualize it or it's just it's crazy. You know, you think oh, utterly destroy or whatever. Yeah. But if we look carefully at the text and go, okay, so important. There's more going on here. Hmm. This mass slaughtering. I tell my students. I, I literally just told them this morning. I was like, the Bible writers didn't have a problem with the meaning of this text. We do. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. there's a big difference there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We've we've lost the context of it. So we mm-hmm. kind of have to understand it. But the people who are reading it then would have known. And what's really fascinating along those lines is that the New Testament writers never condemn the conquest of Canaan. Right. Yeah. Jesus doesn't. Stephen doesn't in his speech. Paul doesn't. The Hebrew writer to the Hebrews, he lauds their faith. Yeah. Right. So we're the ones who are appalled by it, but maybe we need to look more carefully about what's going on there in Joshua than this, what is typically thought of as a genocide, yeah, an ethnic cleansing. Yeah. Maybe, uh, we need to think carefully about what's happening in that. Maybe it's hyperbolic and it seems to be always wrapped around about <clears throat> holiness, you know, like like uh, making sure that, that there's no other idols or anything being brought in and that's wiped away is what you're Absolutely. Saying, and yeah. then really there's, Two reasons for the conquest. One, it is the culmination of Israel's birth as a a nation. God promised them that land. Mm. Number two, removing this influence of theological influence and Mm -hmm. religious practice influence, as well as how they do society, Mm -hmm. where it would be more hierarchical, king, top-down kind of thing. So Israel on that land needs to be unique, because mm-hmm. Yahweh is unique. They need to exemplify what it means to be a worshiper and follower of Yahweh. Yeah. Yeah. That means removing everyone from that. So yeah, it's, that's a tough sell, if you will, because removing people from their land. Mm-hmm. But what we don't see in Joshua is that Israel's going in and punishing the Canaanites. Mm. There isn't, like I said earlier, God isn't angry with the Canaanites, and so he's got to punish them or remove them. It is more has to do with Israel being a unique people on their unique land, worshiping this one God. And we know that still didn't work, Yeah, but that was the goal. Um, I just want to show the parallel even of, um, you know, having them take the land and and occupying the land that that was promised. That is the issue always in the Middle East. That's like literally still what's going on was the Israelites reoccupying. Yeah. 
areas, Gaza, and, and after generations of not being there. Yeah. And then, um, and then bringing back the Hebrew language. Like all this stuff happened. I think that people don't fully understand that Jews were around always, but persecuted in Europe a lot and, mm-hmm. and like in different areas in, mm-hmm. in, in the US. But um, there was a diaspora. And so this, there was a move to move back, the Zionist move to move back to the land and then occupy that. And that might've displaced some of the Palestinians that were there, but then like who has the claim of the land. Mm -hmm. And so, but then if you, you know, you'll hear people are hearkening all the way back to like, Hey, Joshua moved in and he shouldn't have done that in the first place. Mm -hmm. But then that was the land promised to Abraham. Like, like, so man, this has been going on literally forever. Yeah. Nothing new under the sun. huh? And that, (laughs) so, and that's what I think what's so complicated about, well, just life in general, but war especially is that, when you have Israel occupying the land again, Palestinian Christians were displaced. Yeah. Yeah. And that's heartbreaking. It's crazy. You know, yeah. So it there's no simple answer to any of this. The NATO has been trying to push a, a, a two state um, mm-hmm. solution and um, neither of them seem too happy with that kind of a solution. Um, so there we are. This is this is our this is our dilemma. So I think even as we've kind of touched on a lot of stuff and and these differences or perceived differences is what would you your take just simply be if someone asked you like does God condone violence mm-hmm. and so is that because I feel like some people want that to be a blanket statement like a yes right. or a no mm-hmm. and I feel yeah. like as everything is there's a gray area very mm-hmm. few things especially certain elements of theological realities in scripture are very rarely like. Mm-hmm. black and white and this is how it's always is in every single situation yeah. and this is how it's not in every single situation so how would you respond if someone were to ask because I, I mean gen z especially like we are not war people like we are anti-violence people like we are like yeah like there's a lot of this generation that's like i'd rather do literally anything <laughs> than ever go to war or have violence or something like that so how would you respond if someone like a student was like hey J-Dub, like, does God condone violence? Well, and for me, so I'm on board with Gen Z. I'm not, you know, (laughs) I think, you know, I think that if somebody is convicted of murder, let's say, and they, and I don't think anything in the Bible would argue against the death penalty, but I'm not the one who's going to pull that trigger. Right. Or I don't want to kill anybody. Yeah. You know, one thing I say um, to my students often, uh, especially when I teach ethics, is there's a difference between morally good and morally justified. Mm -hmm. There might be situations where we find ourselves morally justified to defend our home or whatever, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't even make that action good. Right. It's just justified. Right. You're just not wrong in the situation. Right. Well, I think that speaks to a lot of even like the things of like, sometimes we can see how God acts in scripture and Mm -hmm. we're like, that is just, but mm-hmm. to me, that's horrifying or right. like that doesn't yes. feel good. So yes. how would I feel like that plays a piece too, where it's like God's justice is also so different from what maybe we would articulate as just. Yeah. Um, and so how would you then like speak to that? So I think, first of all, I think what's very important is that the Bible has often been times used as kind of a strategy for how to execute war <laughs> and justify war. <laughs> Yeah, Bible and, is not a book. The Book of War. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It's so. I think one. Uh, there has been a lot of, especially contemporary scholars, trying to argue away the conquest. It either didn't mm, happen. Yeah. Or, like Gregory Boyd has this book, uh, "The Crucifixion of the Warrior God," and he argues that Israel misinterpreted what God said. Yeah. Mm. He wanted him, it, the Canaanites, to be delivered. And they heard, kill him. Right. So that, but one of the dominant metaphors in the Old Testament, if not the, yeah. is God's a warrior God. Right. So he's engages in violence. He does meet violence with violence. The flood, um, a lot of times he's engaged in violence, but it's, this is very important. He's not a capricious God, meaning he doesn't do things willy nilly or for no rhyme or reason. Yeah. They're justified reactions. But they're oftentimes coupled with mercy at the same time. Yeah. But I think, too, importantly, so going back to the conquest, the conquest of the land of Canaan was a once-for-all-time event. It yeah. wasn't now, okay, now go conquer Babylon. Now go conquer Egypt. Mm. Now go conquer these other nations mm. to where you take over the world. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't that. It was the land, and that's it. Yeah. Never to be repeated again. When 
uh, Israel engages in in warfare, like John Golden Gay identifies five different ways of warfare in the Old Testament, and there's probably more than that. But is one of the main reasons for identifying that is there's diversity in war. There isn't one way to do war. There isn't a strategy plan for how to do war or yeah. justify war. Mm-hmm. Mm. So I think that what we're seeing in the Old Testament, again, is God engages in violence, but it is really to maintain order in his creation, be mm. put, setting aside the conquest. So God's MO isn't violence, isn't, and this is very important as well. When God talks about his character, so one of the sole instances of God's description, self-description, is in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, Mm -hmm. coming off of the golden calf episode. He doesn't say, I'm compassionate, uh, merciful, loyal, truthful, wrathful. Wrath and anger are not part of God's character. Yeah. Right. They're not an attribute. He does get angry. And his anger is used typically as a means, especially with Israel, as a reaction to violation of the covenant, mm-hmm. but also as, as uses anger in a disciplinary way to bring Israel back, to bring Israel to repentance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So because God isn't an angry, wrathful God, that should then impact us about is God pro violence? No, He's pro peace. Yeah. The irony is, though, is how do you establish peace? Mm. War. Yeah. Right. You have to conquer. So Solomon, for example, is a man of peace. How mm. come he's a man of peace? David was a warrior. Yeah. Right. He conquered. Right. So there's some irony going on there as well. But in the end, as Christians, what what we're seeing is that with the cross. Jesus now is embracing violence. Mm. And what's fascinating, I was just read this the other night by a scholar named Moberly. He was saying that the only person that's impacted by the violence on the cross is God himself. Mm. Nobody else is impacted right. by that violence. Yeah. We're saved from it. Yeah. And so what we see in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, and we see this in, I just read it this morning in Hebrews, we also see it with Paul where God says, vengeance is mine. Mm-hmm. We leave retaliation, we, we leave um, injustices done to us in the hands of God yeah. mm. rather than um, going out and violently attacking. So again, what, what do the New Testament writers tell us? Is our warfare is not against flesh and blood, right. but against principalities and powers. Our warfare is in the spiritual realm. It isn't that now God right. is giving us the right to go out and kill someone in the name of God. This is the right. problem of the Crusades. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, you're either going to convert or die. Yeah. Yeah. That can't be our, our gospel no. message, no. right? No. Um, Sounds very not Jesus-y. <laughs> right. Well, I think even to turn it in even, because we talk in this space about like the violence, this like war, this this like kind of all-encompassing space. I've heard a lot and I've seen this like, Kind of, and we, and this is a, a topic that even we got into a little in Theo too about this like, well, God's a child killer. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. his mm. ultimate act of violence was killing, having his own son killed. Mm. Mm-hmm. And how do I then reckon with a God mm-hmm. whose response to have relationship with me was to be violent and to kill his own kid? And so I've seen obvious, like, in, in comments of people uh, in like on social media will comment and whatever to someone's video or whatever talking about Jesus and be like, but your God's a murderer or like your yeah. God's a child killer. Like yeah. that's cosmic child abuse, like that yeah. kind of conversation, which I know we've chatted a little in Theo too about that kind of belief um, of atonement. But and that's so, very important, right? Yes. It's the, How do we dig into that? It That is stems from certain versions of the penal substitutionary at- yeah. atonement. Yeah. Um, so not all penal substitutionary theories are equal. They're not yeah. all the same, but yeah. that is definitely one. And then there's been a lot of feminist scholars that have reacted to that, mm-hmm. and justifiably so, because you have like scholars or theologians like Wayne Grudem, John MacArthur, pastor in Van Nuys, has talked in these terms that the father is punishing the son on the cross. Yeah. He's unleashing his full wrath on the son yeah. and killing the son. Right. But 
If in fact Jesus is Yahweh, if in fact Yahweh is three, then God is hanging on the cross. Right. One of the problems of the penal substitutionary theory, at least in that kind of uh, vein, is it separates the Trinity. Yeah. It's the Father attacking the Son. Right. But we're not seeing that. They hypothesize the, the persons too much. Right. And so it's it's God who is embracing his own judgment, yeah. God embracing the mm. violence uh, on behalf of humanity. So it isn't... So the corrective by feminist scholars is good, but it's it, but it's not. Uh, their solution is get rid of the cross. Yeah, right, right. Can't do that. But it prompted a way. What we need to rethink atonement. What we're thinking about with atonement. Yeah, yeah. and even so, I think I think we can think in terms of the atonement and penal substitutionary ideas, but we need to identify those and clarify what we mean by penalty yeah. and substitution. Because right. clearly, if you look carefully at the text, um, God is not pouring out his wrath. God is not a God who needs to be satiated or his wrath needing to be satiated or him needing to be calmed down. Yeah. That's an ancient or Eastern and Greco-Roman concept that we've imported into the Bible. Yeah, He's... Yes, he gets angry, but his anger isn't uncontrollable. Right. And again, it's it's God hanging on the cross. Yeah, so, I, I um I was just talking to a former student about this, um, who's an avid listener to TikTok theology. Shout out Johan. Johan was, <laughs> he was texting me. Um and he was asking about penal substitutionary atonement. And one thing I said, and what I say very often is the problem with these atonement theories taken as like the catch all, like this is the one, mm -hmm. is that we have to understand that they all are images of a deeper theological reality. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I mean, we can definitely draw that. Like, the sacrificial system is all throughout the Bible, and mm -hmm. understanding what Jesus did on the cross through the sacrifice and through that system is totally legitimate. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not illegitimate at all, but there's just more to it. There's just yeah. the reality right. of being reconciled right. um, because of what Jesus did for us. Right. That There's lots of different ways to talk about it. And so, right. I often say, like, I think we just need to look at the atonement theories together as kind of like um, yeah, speaking good. towards mm -hmm. a big and ineff ineffable mm -hmm. kind of reality of, of how we were made right and, um, and put back in, in, in the relationship with yeah, God. So Joel Green talks about his, his view is the kaleidoscopic view, mm. taking all the images of the atonement together. Yeah. However, like you saying, there are aspects of the penal substitutionary theory that we need to set aside. Right. They're not, that's not there. No. Yeah. So, when you pit it, when you pit the father against the son, and then the son is persuading the father, mm. or now God's no longer an angry God because his anger's been appeased. Yeah. yeah, no, God sent his son. Why? Because he loved humanity, not because he hated humanity yeah. so right. much. As so yeah. I think, so we need to take. And not every forgetting that he is God. This is God doing this for us. <laughs> right. Know? Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like that's a huge, huge thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I yeah. think that helps to then like. Dis deconstruct in a way that there's God is not this violent like yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna kill my own son because that's how I am I'm violent and I need yeah. my own you know anger to be sati satiated because that's yeah. how I am yeah. so yes. I think that helps even so speak again, to the core of that yeah and again anger is not part of his nature. nature what is he slow to anger right he's even tempered yeah you know and when God says he's a passionate or a jealous God he's really that that word there's tricky but it's more like he's a passionate God he's yeah. in, intensely passionate about his people. Yeah. yeah. And because relationship has been violated, that's what sparks his anger mm -hmm. is he got hurt, yeah. if you yeah. will. And it, think about the flood. Why did he bring the flood? Because of grief. Yeah. Not yeah. his anger. Yeah, so, he was he was grieved that he'd ever made Absolutely. Humanity. So why did he why the cross? It's birthed out of his love for humanity. Yeah. Not his not his hate and not his and not unleashing his hatred on his right. son. Yeah. It again, if and this is hard, you know, God is one, but he's three. All three, in a sense, are hanging on the cross in the person of totally. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So yeah. The like uh, uh, Jurgen Maltman's The Crucified God is I think probably one of my favorite mm -hmm. theology books ever. And he said, you know, when Jesus is on the cross. Not only did the son lose his life, but the father lost his son. And mm -hmm. we can't remember that mm -hmm. that state of grief, just imagine any of us who are parents mm -hmm. losing a child. So mm -hmm. like there's, there's, it's a multifaceted, um, mm -hmm. complex issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I want to 
kind of hit before we stop, and this has been such a good discussion, because I hear this often, is a response to understanding God's violent commands of violence and stuff like that. Like Scott McKnight would say, God spoke to people in those days in those ways. And the concept there is God is speaking to people in a way that they would comprehend what it is, but they're not necessarily getting the fullness of what is being said. And, and an image of that is like, if you tell your child, a little child, if they're like, can I have, can I have this ice cream before bed? You're not going to say, no, because see what happens is there's glucose and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Explain all that kind of stuff. Right. Like, uh, which I can't even literally do right now. I tried. I just can't. But like, you're not going to explain all the little like kind of scientific details of why it's unhealthy for a human body or whatever. And they're growing. But you're going to just say something simple that they'll understand. No, mm. it's not good for you. It gives you too much energy mm-hmm. and it's not good for your body. You, get, you need to go to bed. You need to wind down. Mm-hmm. Right. So like um, you're going to say something to them in a way that they would understand mm-hmm. at that time. And so like talking about it in a visual sense, I imagine, okay, so you have things in shalom, perfect peace with nature, with God, with, re- with, with each other. And like, this is in, go- in the garden, we have shalom. And this is always God's kind of like ethical, you know, goal, his telos is to bring us back to shalom and to reconstitute that, to bring it back and to reconcile towards it. And so everything in it is to bring that back. Sabbath is to, to bring these rhythms of shalom back into our life, all that kind of stuff. And so we have shalom and then sin entered the world and we were um, just ripped from it. Like, I mean, it's just completely, utterly gone. Like sin, the the wages of sin is death because we turn our back on God who is life. And so what do you do? You you end up in death, right? So now people are in this place where they're warring, there's evil, there's hatred, all Mm. this stuff, this Mm -hmm. pre-flood kind of, Mm -hmm. kind of reality. And it's because they're so distant from God because they turn their back and they're just totally there. And so when we see, for instance, if we have a, a time, a number line or something, or that, I guess with letters, and there's A on one end and Z on the other. Shalom was A, you know, which is where they're supposed to be. But they moved off. Now they're in B and they're just completely, you know, opposite from God. They're at B. Well, when you have like a law, like eye for an eye, it's moving justice from B right here to non-justice at all to establishing some justice C. And so like if they were like super tribal back then and they had kind of like this mafia logic, you know, like, hey, if you killed my sheep, I'll kill your entire family. Mm. Then, you know, God is saying, no, we're going to put limits of justice onto this. So if someone takes your sheep, you give them your sheep, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Mm -hmm. So he moved B to C and there's incremental steps to where people could actually understand Shalom again, the justice of God again, as we move forward. But it was always done in a way that they would understand in their very, very limited view of reality and this, in the society that's warring. Enter Jesus. Jesus drops us all the way to Q. Like he brings us mm. way over and says, you have heard it say eye for an eye, but I tell you to turn the other cheek. And he's getting towards a reality that's much, much bigger where it's like that thing that was supposed to bring justice, you fossilized and made it into the law. Mm-hmm. And so now people are living by the letter of that law and they're actually bringing unjust practices by that, like that, that mm-hmm. you have this dessert to get back what you, what has been taken, but actually you can be gracious and that's what you should do, um, to, you know, turn the other cheek. And so, um, he's re he's not redefining justice. He's not saying that it was wrong. He's moving them along that line over to Z and Z is kind of this eschaton, the T loss where we're in perfect shalom with everything, but moving us over there. Do you think that's an appropriate way to view how violence is understood in the Old Testament, that it's kind of spoken in a way that they would have understood and that there is this incremental move towards justice, towards shalom, but that shalom will be, and and, I mean, we got a hammer dropped on us when Jesus came in and just changed everything, but then, but it's still moving towards the return of Christ and, and, you know, the reestablishment of the new Jerusalem and stuff like that. Do, do you think that's an appropriate way of kind of? Yeah. I mean, this? I think you're kind of talking about progressive revelation. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, and I think there's some merits to progressive revelation, but what oftentimes happens is then that the end, if you will, or the culmination of that revelation, then now we don't need to think about anything else that happened before. Mm-hmm. I know you're not saying that, but that right, can right, be right. kind of the, the trip of that is that, oh, so everything else that came before towards that end, it no longer has theological merit. Mm, yeah. And I think 
because God still is depicted primarily as a warrior God, there's something that's telling us about God even in those earlier texts. But that being said, when like Joshua, for example, is being written, who the one of the questions is who's who's it written to? Yeah. It's gotta be somebody way late. And so these descriptions of war are part of Israel's distant past, not something that they're practicing now. Right. Yeah. You know, so I think we need to think about that. But also I think progressive revelation has has merit, but we don't want to then decanonize right. what's no, come it, it before. Happened. Yeah, it happened. And that that but also it has theological import. It does, totally. So so it would be more of a both and than I know you're not saying that. No, but totally. That, I'm totally with you. There, yeah. There's an unfoldingness, but there's a lot of of God even doing in the unfolding. Yeah. As as it's coming. I mean, so like even we have, you know, the one of the most epic, I think, awesome images, subversive images in the whole Bible, um, in Revelation, when they heard a roaring lion and they turned and saw a slaughtered lamb. And that's literally mm. the lyrics of Weep No More. This mm. is the video you're in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I want to put that in there. But um, but just a subversion of like mm. This this warrior god, this conquering king, how did he conquer? Right. He conquered by the cross, by taking it for us. And so yeah. um and yet Revelation nineteen, he's coming as a warrior god too to bring judgment on the nations. Right. Right. But even so, that, so like N.T. Wright will argue, so you know how his uh his his robe is is uh, dipped in blood. Some people think that he was conquesting, mm. but um, N.T. Wright argues that that's the blood of the martyrs that mm. actually he's coming mm. to um, to bring justice towards. Mm. Um, so yeah, fascinating. But I think too, I think one thing that I wanted to highlight too is that the God of the Old Testament is obviously depicted and engaged in violence, mm. but he doesn't have, and I'm separating just for analogy here, he doesn't have eternal damnation. Yeah. When you die in the Old Testament, that's it. It's yeah. over. Mm -hmm. Whereas Jesus now introduces mm. something beyond that. Yeah. And so John Golden Gate said there's it's almost far worse, if you will. Oh yeah. The judgment. So there's yeah. so the Bible isn't the New Testament is not exempt from violence. Yeah. No. But what we are not commanded to engage in violence. Mm. Jesus, as you're saying, Stephen, is takes on the violence of the world, right. embraces that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Jesus still has enemies. We're called, Paul calls us enemies of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the New Testament is littered with quoting Psalm 110 1 that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father mm -hmm. until his enemies are made or become a footstool for his feet. Right. Yeah. And those enemies are obviously demonic, but also human beings that resist and reject Christ. Yeah. Mm. And then there is then this, we're all going to face the judgment seat of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And give an account for our life. Jesus still is pointing to the end, like you're saying, yeah. but pointing also to the real potential of being separated forever from God. Yeah. For sure. But even that, like, the, you know, Jesus also says to love our enemies. And then Paul will say, like, if you love them and repeat a kind word to them, it's like pouring, uh, burning coals on their heads. Um, so, um, <laughs> which, which I love, I love how petty that is. You know what I mean? Just like, like Paul's like, you're like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Well, um, would, that would speak then to then it would probably be a different, like God was revealing himself in a different way to the Israelites of the old Testament because they were a nation and they were a people group. And it was very different than, Jesus coming and then yeah. bringing in a priesthood like we are all yeah. a priesthood and, and who yeah. a holy nation like people who are following him and so I feel like that kind of speaks to what the Lord what God was revealing to Israelites when they were right and this is in the their, problem in their ancient Near Eastern like very yeah. <laughs> very different space versus the people who were around when Jesus came yeah and I feel like that speaks and then what we've been since then mm -hmm. speaks to that difference of well we're not all a very specific, like we're not all like the nation of Israel. And so it's a very right. different reality yeah. now. Yeah. And that's what, right. So at the time of Jesus, there's all these messiahs around. Mm -hmm. And the one characteristic of all those messiahs is they're revolutionists. Right. And they do it through violence. Mm -hmm. And this is what Peter's expecting when he says, who do you say that I am? And he says, you're the Christ. You're right. Bingo. Right. Mm -hmm. But then he describes himself. I'm going to die. 
Yeah. yeah. They expected raised, violence. Right. Subversion. They expected wanted, wanted, Jesus to right. come violently. Because he's a king. What right. do kings do? They rule by war yeah. and violence. They conquer. Not this king. Not this king. Right. So it's, he, yeah, it's almost like a complete, it's, right. a, it's a perspective shift. And then Peter says, no way, right? Get behind me, Satan. Yeah. So, so I, I think an important theme is to say it's not that violence is absent in either testament's the point that you're making. It is all wrapped up in the idea that in this God is establishing his justice, mm-hmm. his reconciliation, and, and ultimately establishing shalom. Mm-hmm. And so much of it is I'm going to subvert your expectations, subvert this this kind of like talk of war and stuff like that in your own language and then show you, you know, the truth about it. That this king doesn't do that. This king mm-hmm. This king is born in a manger. This king, you know, comes back and then takes the wrath of, of people upon him to, in order to save them. And I, and I think that's, you know, a beautiful gospel mm-hmm. message that, that, that reverberates in the, in the kind of the realism that there is violence and war in this world. Yeah, and that God, he uses Israel, but they fail. All the time. In their mission to be the people of God. Yeah. So he takes on human flesh Jesus is Israel, Mm -hmm. fulfills where Israel failed. Mm -hmm. He succeeds and then embraces violence rather than executing violence. But he provides free access to relationship to him. Yeah. Yeah. But if you reject it, judgment. Yeah, that's still that's still the wages of sin. Still 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 the wage (laughs) of of turning your back to, to God who is life. Right. Is death. So right. um, that's really good. So as we wrap up here at the end. Um, so good. So good. I could, I could listen forever. But how should we understand God's character in a way that's faithful to scripture and is relevant for us today? So we like to end with these like pastoral, these ministerial moments where you can give something really practical. Because we talk a lot of theology. We talk a lot of mm. things. But what advice could you give that's tangible to Christians today that's understanding these kinds of tough issues like violence and war and that kind of stuff? Well, it seems like war is inevitable. War is ugly, gross, horrible, but it's uh, like Golden Gate saying, you know, like a necessary evil, but not calling, God isn't calling us to be an army that is engaging as uh, Christian warriors to mm-hmm. conquer people groups. Um, we want to conquer them with the good news of the gospel. Yeah. yeah. But I think, too, that one way we could think about that in a pastoral way of, let's say, God's anger, is that the writer to the Hebrews talks about how we know that we're children of God and we have a heavenly father because he disciplines us. Yeah. Yeah. When he gets angry with Israel, as I said earlier, it's always with a redemptive purpose. Mm -hmm. It's always to bring Israel back. And the same thing in my own experience has been when God has gotten angry with me and I've actually experienced pain, real pain. Yeah. But it's God calling me back to him to repent. Yeah. And calling me back to relationship with him. When he's angry, it's because I violated relationship with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've hurt him. He's grieved. And... I need to be either ex- embrace my uh, discipline or be better yet, quick to repent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and yeah. uh, ask God to forgive me. But I think, you know, the violence of God, the anger of God is is revealing something very important that God is a, a real being that feels yeah. and feels intensely. Yeah. He isn't a robot. It's He's not a magical formula. He's not a philosophy. He's a... A person that's good with feelings, and um, we're engaged in a relationship that's dynamic, a give and take, yeah. Yeah. and um, and equally so, I can get angry with God, <laughs> frustrated with God, yeah. and express those. I mean, you can let read, him know, yeah. read the Psalms, yeah. right, all over them. Oh yeah, you know, and so we're free to express our frustration with God and anger with God. Yeah. Um. So it is really in the bottom line, um, we're in a relationship. Yeah. With a living being. Good. Yeah. So. It's good. Awesome. So good. Um, you know, J-Dub, it's a pleasure to always chat with you. Um, you are a mentor to all of us and have been to a lot of people through the years. And um, I think people can see why. Um, you've got wisdom, clarity, but also <laughs> biblical like you let the Bible say what the Bible says 
without like giving into what somebody wants it to say or how somebody feels about it. And I think that's a really, really important thing for all of us to take, yeah. you know, um, as we're going here. If you like what J-Dub said, that man can teach you. <laughs> At Life Pacific University. <laughs> Which this podcast is sponsored <laughs> by the School of Theology and Ministry at Life Pacific University. Nice to set up. Plug. She got it. Plug. All well, right. it, real quick, it's been an absolute joy to be with you too. So oh, I really you. enjoyed this. I was actually a little panicked, <laughs> but uh, not as crazy and stressed as it feels. No. <laughs> More panicked about the subject than yeah. you two. So, oh, it's good. A, hey, it's a tough subject. Yeah. Not easy answers, but I think yeah. you you handled it uh, perfectly. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jada, for being with us today. Thank you. We're so thankful for you. See you all next time. See ya.